Okay, welcome. Welcome back to this uh, last uh, panel of this uh, conference on, on big techs. This is uh, basically a wrap-up session. So we are supposed to discuss evolving regulatory and supervisory architecture to oversee uh, big techs. My name is Fernando Restoy, I'm chair of the Financial Stability Institute here at the, at the, at the BIS. I think over the past uh, day and a half, we have covered uh, much ground from a diverse set of speakers. Uh, we have actually looked at different challenges associated to the participation of big techs in, in finance, covering different financial stability, prudential, competition, data uh, governance uh, challenges. Again, I think it has been an incredibly rich uh, set of uh, discussions, uh, interventions, presentations. I think we have learned a big deal out of, out of that. I think uh, the discussion has shown that big techs uh, do not constitute at present, I underlie the words present, an immediate and critical uh, threat for the stability and the integrity of the financial, and the financial system. So they are not the great vampire squids in the digital area, just to use the term uh, that was first introduced by uh, Marty Ivey in a famous article I think published in the in Rolling Stone magazine a few, a few years ago. Uh, and indeed, uh, the benefits of uh, big techs in terms of uh, promoting innovation, efficiency, financial inclusion, uh, have been stressed actually by many speakers in the different panels of this, uh, of this conference. Um, although it's true that some of them introduced some relevant nuances when talking about as well of, of the opportunities that big techs actually create for the, for the financial system. But at the same time, I think it's fair to recognize that basically all regulators in this table, as well as us, all academics, actually they intervened in, different, in the different panels they have all shown actually concerns on, on the relevant risks that the participation of big techs in finance could actually generate. Some of those risks have already materialized, others remain latent, but pretty much linked to the very unique business model of big techs and its likely evolution over, over time. So I think those, those considerations certainly provide sufficient ground to move from, from theory, high-level considerations, concerns, et cetera, to, to practice, to, practice to, to policy action. And indeed, we have heard from many speakers some relevant policy initiatives taken in different, uh, different jurisdictions. Those initiatives uh, uh, try to address specific risks on specific areas. We have heard some actions in the, what has to do with interaction between banks and big techs about the participation or the provision by big techs of critical uh, services to financial institutions. Uh, we have heard also initiatives in the area of the participation of big techs in the, in the crypto world. Uh, this morning, actually, we have discussed at length issues about the data and, 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 and competition, right? But I think probably we, can, we cannot adjourn this conference without addressing more, more directly uh, whether we need actually sort of more comprehensive and fit for purpose uh, regulatory framework uh, for big techs that try to address all the different actually challenges that they pose for the adequate functioning of the financial system. As you heard from our general manager, Agustin Carson, uh, yesterday morning, we here at the BIS, I think uh, we actually, we actually uh, are of the view that indeed there is there is sufficient arguments to consider seriously de developing, developing some international standards uh, on uh, group-wide regulatory frameworks for big techs. So the possibility of introducing entity-based regulations complementing activity-based rules, sectoral rules that already, already apply to many of the financial activities that big techs, uh, big techs perform. But of course, we are pretty much aware of the challenges that this task will, will, will imply. Uh, so we know that, of course, this is plenty of implementation issues. Also, we have to address a number of political and technical constraints. And those elements, of course, of course are quite relevant for a, for a meaningful policy, policy discussion. So fortunately, we have today here with, with me uh, absolutely superb lineup of speakers uh, that they are absolutely able to 
deal with the very issue, what should be the right policy response to the risk posed by the participation of big techs in, in, finance, in finance, as well as to address the specific uh, technical complexities in, and, and, and trade-offs. So let me introduce them very briefly because they don't need much introduction. Uh, Tobias Adrian, my right, he's the financial counselor as, as well as director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department of the International Monetary Fund. Jose Manuel Campa is the chair of the European Banking Authority. We have uh, Caroline Pham, a commissioner at the US Commodities Future and Trading uh, Commission. And then virtually, uh, we are joined as well by Chang Nen Xuan, who is a deputy uh, governor of the People's Bank of, of China. So again, quite, uh, quite a distinguished uh, panel of speakers with different, different backgrounds coming from different parts of the world. And I'm sure that they will actually provide a very, very good set of insights for our reflection on these important matters. Um, so we are going to follow the same format we have been following uh, all along the conference. So we'll start by asking all the speakers to deliver some introductory remarks, basically trying to, to basically convey the main messages that, uh, that they feel they, they need to be conveyed in, in, in what respects the, the overall topic that we're going to discuss in this, in this panel. So let me first invite Tobias to basically for him to provide us the the global perspective from the from the IMF, from you know developments of uh, the participation of big techs in finance, policy challenges that this imply. <coughs> Tobias, thank you for joining us. Mm. Thanks so much, Fernando, and thanks uh, to the BIS for hosting this uh, uh, extremely timely and important event. Um, the expansion of big tech into financial services is happening rapidly. Uh, but it is quite uneven when you look uh, at, at this uh, from a global perspective. So uh, uh, around uh, countries, including advanced economies uh, like here in Europe, but also emerging markets and developing economies around the world. Um, we are certainly at the, of, of the view at the, at the IMF that authorities must uh, take steps to monitor and to respond to uh, the risks uh, that are arising uh, and uh, to continue to ensure uh, the smooth functioning of financial markets and uh, financial institutions. So what we are doing at the IMF is, on the one hand, surveillance, so basically assessing uh, countries uh, uh, from our 190 membership um, uh, in terms of policy developments, and we also do capacity building, so we help countries uh, to build capacity on financial regulation, including on uh, big techs uh, in financial services. And of course, uh, as was discussed uh, yesterday and, and this morning already, uh, big techs uh, have entered um, uh, to varying degrees across countries into payments, uh, lending, and insurance. And of course, that is creating a lot of opportunities uh, in many countries, in particular in emerging markets and developing economies, uh, in terms of access to financial services, reducing costs of access, delivering new products, and increasing efficiency. So, so I do think the opportunities and, and, and the benefits are, are, are quite substantial um, in, in a number of countries uh, in, in many respects. But of course, there are also many new risks. And um, again, we have heard uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous panel and in the, in the speech uh, by, by Francois this morning, um, you know, concentration, market contestability, and interlinkages are the three uh, main concerns that are giving rise to consumer uh, protection concerns, uh, to market integrity concerns, and broader uh, financial uh, stability concerns. Um, <clears throat> so at the IMF, together with the World Bank in 2018, so nearly five years ago, we de developed what we call the Bali FinTech Agenda. And that's a broad set of principles. Uh, these are 12 principles that are very broad. They include uh, um, regulatory and, and legal approaches, but they also have macroeconomic, monetary, uh, fiscal, um, and uh, much broader uh, policies uh, towards uh, fintech. And uh, you know, in preparation for, for this meeting, I, I was looking back at this uh, Bali FinTech agenda, and I think it, it reads uh, very fresh, actually, even after five years. So uh, you, know, really, you really want to have a very holistic uh, uh, approach 
uh, to uh, to looking at at fintech and and you know this particular aspect that we are discussing today, which is the entrance of of big tech into financial services. You know there are many interrelated risks, and of course there are many different agencies uh, that are um, that are uh, responsible uh, for the varying various risks. Um, and uh, who is responsible for that is very country specific, right? So, so the setup of you know, who is responsible for data, for uh, competition concerns, for contestability, for financial uh, sector regulation, um, the, 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 the packaging of, uh, of that is, is very, very different across countries. And, and that, of course, makes international cooperation uh, challenging. Um, um, you know, many of, of, of the uh, benefits, but also the risks are, are, are very much cross-border in nature. So, um, you know, last year we put out uh, a, a paper on this specific to topic on, on uh, big tech and financial services, and we certainly urged our membership uh, to take uh, action, regulatory action, <coughs> Uh, that has become quite urgent in a number uh, of areas. Um, so I think, um, you know, in terms of the policy agenda, we see it uh, in the near term in terms of really improving disclosure and transparency uh, and uh, strengthening outsourcing uh, requirements. And, you know, authorities should certainly use uh, the existing toolkits, the existing uh, laws um, for prudential and conduct regulations in order to manage the risks uh, for consumers, markets, and financial stability uh, that I, I mentioned. Of course, in the longer term, a more holistic policy approach and a more holistic regulatory approach uh, that is combining both entity-based um, uh, regulation, uh, particularly for home authorities, and then more activities-based regulation for host authorities. So, in the, in the keynote this morning, that was already alluded to, and perhaps we can expand on, on that idea here in the panel. Uh, so our view uh, is, is really that, uh, you know, uh, the home authorities have to have uh, this entity-based approach, while host authorities uh, need to take a more activities-based approach. Um, so in China, and I'm sure we will hear from that, of course, in China, uh, that has already required certain big tech firms uh, to create financial holding companies uh, for financial services activities. So, uh, you know, that, that was certainly, um, you know, one uh, very important step um, uh, in, in terms of uh, getting a regulatory approach there. In the U.S., uh, I think Nellie uh, Lang spoke yesterday, um, you know, there's certainly a consideration of entity-based regulation. Um, and in the EU, EU, which I'm sure we will hear more about as well, uh, there's, of course, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Operational Resilience Act, uh, the first uh, for the gatekeepers, the second one for the third-party risk. Um, you know, the, the, the major challenge, uh, again, is this cross-border nature of big tech, uh, you know, the fact that uh, all these products flow seamlessly across borders. And so I would reiterate uh, what Luigi Zingale said in the previous panel, uh, you know, having uh, global standards, having global cooperation is, is very, very important in this area as well. And we are certainly working with the membership uh, and with other international bodies uh, to move uh, towards uh, such, uh, such a, a global cooperation. Let me stop here. Okay, many thanks, Tobias. Of course, we've already uh, identified a number of issues that uh, we should actually cover in the rest of the of the panel discussion, the issue of the you know, international cooperation, the issue about the combination of entity and, and activity-based rules. Pretty much how they will have time to, to dig deeper into those, those matters. Uh, Jose Manuel, please turn now maybe to convey your European perspective on, on this matter. Mm? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you for inviting me to the panel and congratulations on organizing the conference, which I think is timely and important. Yeah, I will try to, to briefly explain a little bit what we're doing in Europe, particularly in the context of, of financial supervision in this context, and how do we see it right now and some of the challenges of cooperation that we already see at the local and at the, at the local, the European and the global level. Uh, first, let me start, and then Fernando highlighted this as well, you know, uh, giving you a little bit of a map of what's the current status quo of the provision of financial services by big techs in the European Union. This is actually uh, quite small. You know, there are, well, it's, it's not how many you, you count uh, big techs, but basically we now have 
uh, by our measures, uh, eight big techs which are registered as provider of financial services. All eight are registered as payment institutions or e-money institutions, so they're basically in the payments business. Only one is registered as a credit institution. So uh, just because it's small doesn't mean that they're not prevalent. We think they're prevalent in many other financial services and many financial service activities, and this obviously is an area of focus and potentially concern, and there's already been a lot of uh, comments on, on, the, on the actions that Europe has taken in terms of legislation to advance in, in, in this area, you know, with the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Service Acts, obviously the more specific, the, the operational resilience and, and the crypto assets, which I will keep aside. But if I might say, you know, rather than break it by legal acts, I like to break it on topics of concern. You know, one topic of concern, which is broad, I think, is, is the breakup of the value added chains of who provides a financial service and who is responsible from the regulatory point of view of, provi of providing that financial service. You know, so as we see with these big techs, is they help basically to subcontract parts of the value added chain. You know, that uh, has been more prevalent and more obvious for most of us by now in the operational resilience part on the IT services, and we have legislation now in place, which is the Digital Operational Resilience Act, which will has mandated us as the ABA, we join with the other ESAs to actually make sure that there is oversight, proper oversight, and that the assumption, which is a, a little bit, I think, limited in nature, that ultimately, you know, the responsible entity is the supervised entity for the whole value of the change, and that the supervised entity should have capabilities and provide access to the supervisors throughout the value of the chains, regardless of what is being subcontracted outside the entity to a big tech or to another third party provider or remains within the company. Now, that's in the process of being regulated. At, 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 sorry, it's already regulated. We're developing the second level regulation. It's in the process of being under oversight. I'll come back to it in a minute how we are going to do that. But I think that that problem of the breakup of the value of the chains is bigger and it's going to get only bigger because as we think about the provision, not just on the back end, the IT services, but on the front end, on the commercialization of the products. It's very clear, obviously, that there are already partnerships that are being taking place between big techs and financial services firms for the distribution of products. And we've seen that also more prevalent in some of them that may not be entity-based, but again, activity-based with some business models that were, for instance, the buy now, pay later as a, as a, as a credit-providing service that was done through digital activities and through uh, digital platforms in a, in a relatively large manner, small segment yet, and probably a segment that with higher interest rates will be less likely to continue to be as successful, but nevertheless, that exists. So on the commercialization aspect, clearly break up of the value of the change, but also many times on the risk measurement aspects. As we go into artificial intelligence, and now we're thinking about the artificial intelligence, machine learning, these are essential tools the companies, financial firms will use for credit scoring, for credit assessment, for parts of the core of financial institutions. And we think that it's likely that there will be a lot of subcontracting there as well, or at least partnership with some of these big tech firms. And again, you know, the responsibility here will remain still, still with the raised financial institution. These big techs will not be uh, provide, uh, providing technically financial products, but at the end of the day, if I think that they control the back end, they control the front end, and they control the middle by making the assessment, well, what's left? What's left? You know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a serious source of concern that we need to think more holistically. So far, we're really only focusing on the regulation on the back office part, on the digital operational resilience. I think that's a challenge as we go forward. Beyond that, if I may, the second aspect, some of the challenges of how we see the regulation and the supervision of this that has been highlighted, how to implement it in practice. We are a sectoral regulator with the European Banking Authority. You know, so we have regulation as one part of the sector. However, for this part of the digital operational resilience, same thing for crypto assets, we clearly have a mandate of forced, I would say forced collaboration because we have a joint mandate with the other two sector regulators in the European Union, the, 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 insurance, the, the insurance Authority and the Markets Authority to jointly develop both their second level regulatory products and jointly develop the oversight of these uh, third party providers for financial services. So this is just a clear example for, of how uh, you, know, you need to integrate, and this is just within the financial sector. Within that mandate, obviously, we need to reach out in this case for the operational resilience with the uh, ENISA, which is the regulator for uh, information systems and cybersecurity in the European Union. And that's just one small aspect, because at the end of the day, this is one part of a bigger project, which, of course, should be the cross-border beyond the European Union regulation and, and interaction, an area that so far, I might say, you know, we are... At the, at the, I would say, infancy 
of that process. You know, which respect that would be developed farther uh, as well for us. And this is just a small example, but concrete, of a small challenge, which is just not only on the operational resilience aspect. As I think about the front end, as I think about the marketing of the products, and you know, listening to the conversation that we that we heard earlier this morning on data uses, competition aspects, bundling. These are uh, some of the challenges that we'll be really confronted with. If I may, just one last aspect, and again, using only the operational resilience as an example, you know, we think that we like the way that things should be done and need to be done to guarantee operational resilience in the financial sector. But of course, technical IT operational resilience does not only, it's not only a problem in the financial sector. There are many other sectors in the economy that also think they need to have operational resilience. And you can think about you know, transportation, health, whatever, whatever sector you think. I'm sure many of those sectoral regulations think that that's important. The providers, the third parties, are providing those services to all of them. The providers of cloud service are providing cloud services to all these sectors in the economy. So the logic that we're going to go sectoral by sectoral, you know, providing regulation and oversight that provides, gives us individual confidence I think it has its limits. At some point, you know, we need to have somewhere where we provide overall confidence that, that there is resilience in the provision of those services, and that's cross-sectoral in nature because the business is cross-sectoral in nature. And by the way, the potential providers of those services, they're making us, as sectoral professors, very aware of that point. You know, so it's not a point that we make, but that they like to make very much. So let me stop here for now. Okay, very good. Interesting remarks about uh complexities actually of sort of designing regulatory framework, taking into account actual these different aspects. So different policy domains are actually interconnected and each of the policy domains affecting not only financial, the financial industry, but also the whole economy, right? <laughs> right, thank you very much for this, uh, Sosha and well, now, uh, Caroline, please, is your turn. As you know, we're eager to listen to your perspective, a US regulator taking into account that basically the home jurisdiction of most big techs which are active worldwide, it's actually the US. Hmm? They are US companies. Well, this has been a fascinating conference and has been a lot of thought-provoking ideas, so I will try to be provocative with my remarks today. I want to thank Chair Rastoy and the BIS and General Manager Carstens for having me here. I have found that I really enjoy hanging out with central bankers uh, because I'm not one, and it's been really great to be in this group. Um, let me give my standard disclaimer, which is that the views that I share today are just those of my own as a commissioner and does not necessarily represent the views of the CFTC or of any other commissioner. And let me give an additional one that while the CFTC has a unique role as a functional regulator of banks, because we oversee the swap dealing activity of banks. I'm not a prudential supervisory authority, so I will feel free to look into the future and to tee up some issues that then the central bankers and supervisors will ultimately have to address. Now, first, I wanna talk about what is the problem in big tech and financial services that we are trying to solve for here. Only by defining the problem can we propose potential solutions, and I have a different framing of the problem. And in the Q&A, then we can talk about some of the ideas for a US approach. So I take it back to first principles and just to go a little bit into US regulation. When we think about regulation in the United States, there are different schools of thought, but generally one is that the government should not interfere in individual liberty or commercial activity. And if there is a need for regulation that imposes obligations on citizens, that it is done at the state level. Only when there is an overriding federal interest, then we have the federal government step in with legislation that can preempt state law. And so we either have state regulation, a dual system of state and federal regulation, like our banking system, uh, or federal regulation that preempts state law, like our securities and commodity derivatives regulation. Okay, so we have done our American civics lesson, and let's do some crystal ball gazing. In keeping with Jillian's scene setting about tribes, I will tell you that I am part of three tribes that are relevant to our discussion today. I'm a regulator, but I also used to work at a bank, and I am, according to Wikipedia, a millennial, although I dispute that. Uh, and I am a middle child, so hopefully I can help to bridge this debate here. Now, I also completely agree with the remarks yesterday about starting with the role of the customer. You know, in my previous role at a bank, we would try to imagine what the future of banking would look like and what and how the customer wants to engage. So in 5, 10, 15 years, what does the world look like? How do people use financial services? How do we provide financial services? So let's do a day in the life of the customer. 
And you know, to some of the remarks that have been made earlier, when we talk about big tech, we really mean about five companies, American companies, but each of them have very different commercial business models. But what I would argue that what they have in common is that they are platforms that control access and distribution. And to me, this is the major concern that regulators need to act in the public interest and prevent potential harm to society, and that would provide the overriding federal interest that could result in federal regulation at the group level. Uh, so let me give you an example. I don't use a computer. I do everything on my cell phone, even marking up documents and clearly writing my remarks and everything else. Um, you know, I do everything from my phone, which is the portal to the internet and increasingly validates my digital identity. Um, I access information and content through internet search and maps and YouTube, and people have access to me via my email there. I voluntarily put listening devices in almost every room of my home, and I use that to control my home environment, but it's also how I buy my groceries and things that I use in my day and my life. And all of my work is done through one company, which provides word processing and other software that you're familiar with, and it also controls my business identity on my business social media website. And I do use another photo social media website, not that much, but that's how I see what some of my friends are doing. So these five platform companies, they control access and distribution for almost all of my life. And to refer her back to yesterday's conversation about illusion, I may have the illusion that I have the control, but I don't really think that's the case. So continuing to be provocative, I will say that I do not think that data protection is the biggest issue here. I think that that train has already left the station and we will never be able to unscramble that egg. I know that my data is out there. In fact, uh, it's known that I think many years ago, uh, the federal government <coughs> database for government employees was hacked and so there are probably multiple versions of me walking around somewhere in the world. And um, I get alerts all the time that my information is on the dark web and there's nothing that I can do about it. And there's a whole new generation that has very little expectation of privacy and is not that concerned about their data. So what I think then about this control and this access and distribution, so I start from the competition angle. So again, the control they have over access and distribution and my data, that is the potential societal harm where the public interest is in having some guardrails and having some checks and balances on that control. And also if we look 15 to 20 years into the future and we think about the metaverse, that um, I know the European Union is looking at studying, this problem is even more heightened if they can control an immersive environment of our physical and virtual lives. So in keeping with some of the discussion yesterday around the tower and the square, I will call this the circle, that we live in this bubble created and controlled for us by these platform companies. So turning from that's the problem I see in big tech. Let's talk about the future of financial services and crypto and how the intersection of that with big tech requires a global solution. So during this conference, we have been talking about money and trust. And I think that crypto has happened because of a societal problem that we have with money and trust. Something has happened so that there are tens of millions of people around the world who do not understand the value of money and the importance of banks and a safe and sound banking system, that they are buying fake money with real money. And the Bitcoin believers, it's like a religion. So this is a problem, and I will leave it to the central bankers, but now we have crypto to deal with, which is a symptom of that problem, that societal problem. And we know the origin story of Bitcoin as well coming out of the great financial crisis. So when we think about this universe of crypto assets, I'll give you my three buckets of how I approach them. There's digital finance and tokenization, so these are financial products and services. There's non-financial activities, and then there's the blockchain technology itself. I also want to give a special word about stable coins. So to me, the world moved away from the gold standard a long time ago. And we have had fractional reserve banking and rehypothecation for credit creation and economic growth for a reason. And banks can do this because of the social contract that they have and that they are almost like quasi public utilities. So I have to wonder, what are we doing by creating these giant piles of one-to-one -one stable coins that have cash or, or US treasuries behind them? In some respects, they're almost like tokenized treasuries. But if we want to have tokenized treasuries, why don't we just do that through our primary dealer system that we have in the United States already? So I think maybe the stable coins will start to call me up, but that is you know, one of the things that I kind of wonder there about, about stable coins. And, and then if you have these um, 
private tokenized treasuries, but it's not done through the primary dealer system, which is highly regulated uh, and with the SEC and so on. What does that mean for the US and the US dollar and monetary policy? So I think where we end up with stable coins is that it's really a tech wrapper around money in its various forms. So public money like CBDCs, like digital fiat, private money like commercial bank money, non-bank e-money, or an asset like a money market uh, mutual fund. So again, I ask why are we repeating history again, keeping in some of the themes of what people were talking about yesterday. So then for the leftover crypto assets where people want to engage in them from a pure speculative or for entertainment purposes, you know, that's fine. The same way that I can buy lottery tickets or sneakers or beanie babies or tulips. You know, there's a lot of the same customer protection and fraud issues there that you find in other peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. So when I think about non-financial activities, there's a lot of the uh, other legal and regulatory frameworks that people have mentioned that would apply. And then with utility tokens, which is a, which I would consider a non-financial activity, those could be like an exchange where I can buy and sell airline and hotel rewards points. That's how we think about utility tokens. So what we have here now in common with big tech and blockchain is the inherently borderless and potentially near frictionless cross-border transactions use cases that this conference has been discussing. So to me, this is a compelling public interest issue and a reason to start with a global solution that looks at international standards and the need for group level supervision and some type of home slash host approach, although I do query what does it mean to have a home host approach when you have some of these companies, particularly these crypto companies that assert that they are stateless entities. I think, um, and as we move into the metaverse, I, I worry about non-state actors and what that means. So I have ideas about applying the segregation and the inclusion approach that was in General Manager Carson's speech uh, in the United States, which I will save for the Q&A. So for the financial services problem, I really look at that and I approach that from competition. But these are classical issues around anti-tying and bundling that we already have rules for. And so then with my final thought, I'll leave you that although blockchain and big tech could result in disintermediation, again, let's not forget the history of money and markets and the lessons we learned that led us to our current system today and the importance of intermediaries and that we have friction in the financial system on purpose. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Caroline, very rich introductory remarks. I take note of one uh, important aspect of what you have said, which is the need of uh, some sort of international agreements on, on the regulatory front when we talk about all these related issues. Great, so let me now move to Chang and Shua. Of course, uh, again, China is a jurisdiction in which much more policy action has already taken place in relation to, to big tech. So looking forward to your, to your remarks, and thank you very much for joining us. Huh? Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Restoy. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you uh, China's practices and priorities in big tech regulation, particularly with respect to their financial activities. Of course, all the work we have done are still preliminary and, and ongoing. and. Uh, uh, for this uh, presentation, I prepared some pages of PPTs, but uh, uh, probably I won't have enough time to go through all of them. So, uh, so I, I will try to skim through. And uh, um, before I get started, jump to page five here. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, since early 2000s, uh, there have been constant uh, technological disruptions to all aspects of financial services. While this have generated many new opportunities. It has also given rise to a lot of new challenges and risks. The most recent collapse of the crypto exchange FTX is a reminder of the huge potential risks uh, that involve that is involved in this process. With many more high net net worth individuals and institutional investors, mature markets would be able to withstand such uh, high risk uh, events with resilience, but uh, given China's reality where we have so many individual small investors um, with such a devastating loss and, uh, you know, uh, it might trigger strong public reaction. So regulators like us have to uh, act uh, to protect in the interest of investor protection and in the interest of financial stability. Across the world, the, the prior speakers have, have uh, 
uh, give presentation uh, and introduction to the regulatory actions and initiatives. And uh, uh, to different degrees, uh, regulatory authorities have all strengths and supervision and regulation on big techs, especially with their financial activities to different degrees. Um, for example, the EU and the US have uh, all uh, put forward ambitious legislative actions, which uh, uh, addressed some of the issues we were talking about here today. So, uh, but in China, uh, we, uh, uh, like our counterparts in the EU and the US and other countries, China also undertook a lot of regulatory efforts over the last few years. But our efforts uh, are regarded as more intensive for two reasons. First, uh, the reason is that uh, uh, the, you know, we, until this recent uh, effort, we are mostly an entity-based as opposed to activities-based framework in terms of regulatory uh, mindset. So big tech's inroads into financial services were particularly fast and noticeable in China. And uh, uh, people were talking about how the, the, the big penetration of uh, mobile payments um, uh, into our daily lives. So the, the big penetration uh, not 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 only in in mobile payment but also in credit, uh, in uh, uh, easier access, cheaper cost uh, of access to financial services, and also higher returns on uh, some of the uh, wealth management products and so forth and so on and so forth. Also, uh, unlike in the U.S. and the uh, and in the EU, which already have sound regulatory framework and proven investor protection practices. So we have a much bigger agenda to set up uh, our regulatory framework and, and mend the fences at the same time when we talk about uh, to address some of the issues and challenges uh, with respect to big tax financial activities and, and footprints. So uh, now I, I jump jump to page five here in the in the in the PPT here. So um, the, 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 when I talk about big tech regulation, I really mean. Uh, regulation of big tax financial activities here. So uh, it can be uh, divided into three phases. So the first one, we call it the wait and see uh, 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 framework. So that is from early 2000s to late 2020. Uh, in that period, regulatory environment was very uh, accommodative. Phase two, we call it the main offenses. That is from late, late 2020 to late 2022. Uh, during that several years, we had uh, a preliminary uh, uh, regulatory framework uh, up and running, and, uh, and, and, the, and the surface would be from the late last year to onward. So where we, you know, regulatory uh, and, and regulation and, and, and the supervision uh, have become a normal routine. And uh, so we conduct uh, those uh, uh, efforts on a, on a regular basis. So next page, please. So the, the wait and see phase, or which is the, you know, uh, uh, run, was running for more over a decade. So in, in the early 2000s, the highly accommodative environment in China enabled tech firms to thrive and prosper. But also, of course, as I mentioned, the problems arise as well as a result. The gains include, uh, you know, uh, we had some notable uh, tech firms such as Alibaba and Tencent, which became uh, highly competitive even uh, in, uh, globally. And they brought about efficiencies, cost reduction, financial inclusion, and, and, as you, and, and also uh, 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 higher returns on some of their products uh, offered and easier access to credit as well. And, and, and the, the challenges is that they, they conducted uh, many of their financial services uh, in unregulated or unlicensed uh, entities, uh, arbitrage was very noticeable, and they gained uh, unfair advantages uh, as compared to uh, traditional financial institutions. Also, anti-competition practices and uh, winner takes all approach, and uh, using their uh, dominant positions, uh, and, and also predatory actions in terms of marketing, and uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, data leak, leak, uh, leakages and, and abuses and, uh, uh, and privacy uh, 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 infringement, so on and so forth. 
Next page, please. So in the second phase, as, as I mentioned, uh, starting uh, from late, uh, starting from late 2020, we set out to uh, to establish a, a framework for big techs. The corrective actions had three priorities. Uh, first is the supervision of uh, their uh, financial services activities. The second and third uh, priorities are, are not led by us, but uh, by other government agencies. But the uh, first priority is to to put all the financial services under regulation and uh, and uh, and and where appropriate and and uh, uh, and amenable uh, put into a licensed entities. And PBOC was uh, has been a lead agency in this respect. Next page, please. So uh, in this phase, uh, we um, uh, have established three principles of, regu of regulating uh, financial activities of big techs. First of all, we reinforce a license requirement on financial activities of all the big techs. And uh, secondly, prevent, we want to prevent uh, cross-sector contagion of risks. Uh, third, we, want, we uh, establish a rule to break the data network financial activities loop. And uh, uh, currently, 14 platform companies and uh, meaning 12, uh, uh, aside from uh, Alibaba and Tencent or Ant Financial Group, we have uh, 12 other platform companies were asked to uh, to correct their irregularities uh, in line with the above mentioned principles. Second page, please. Next page, please. So, um, so we basically have two a combination of two approaches. Basically, the first is the activity-based approach, which says that same activity, same risk, same rule, or as some other people put it, uh, uh, like activity, like regulation. And uh, this this covers payment business, credit extension business, and and also. Uh, 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 credit scoring business and so on and so forth, internet deposits business, fintech credit, so on and so forth, and, and also wealth management as well. Next page, please. Another approach is, is entity-based approach as mentioned by uh, prior speakers. Basically, we, 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 uh, um, we put out a trial measure on regulation of financial holding companies and uh, Qualified big techs are asked to set up, create and financial holding companies and put all their financial services activities under an umbrella of a financial holding company. So we shall regulate it on a consolidated basis and subject to macro potential and uh, other requirements. Next page, please. So, um, and, and I want to skip this one and next one, uh, I want to jump to page 13, please. So, um, and in this process, we, uh, we uh, gain some experiences, which, he, which are broadly, we, we realize that we must support healthy development of the private sector, the platform economy and the digital economy, including those 14 platform companies. Also, we also, we need to increase policy transparency and protect intellectual property rights. And also we are going forward and we follow uh, market oriented and law based approach in line with international norms. Next page. So, so the, third, the third phase, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is prudential and inclusive regulation. So that is starting from uh, you know, late last year and uh, we are right in, right in the beginning of it. So in this current kind of phase, there is a, a more enabling environment for uh, prudent and inclusive regulation on a routine basis. Um, so uh, in this now the the environment, the policy environment or regulatory environment is is much more favorable than uh, the last few years. Uh, after two years of intensive efforts, the traffic light for big techs with respect to their financial activities in particular are up and running and uh, uh, and the, and this new environment provides more certainty to market expectations. So, and, and, and from the uh, market participants' point of view, the big techs are more ready to embrace supervision, and they now have 
better compliance awareness, and are more used to the idea that all financial services activities are subject to supervision and uh, should be conducted with proper licenses where appropriate. Next page, please. So, uh, going forward, we uh, have the following priorities. First, we want to, uh, since, since, you know, the, it's, it's just uh, in the very beginning of the third phase. So, we want to continue to beef up uh, the regulatory regime and, and build up our capacity to monitor and supervise. And also, we want to continue to tap the role of big techs in promoting growth, job creation, and innovation. Next page. So, and, uh, and before I conclude, I want to say that we stand ready to participate in international cooperation uh, forums like this and stand ready and, in, and also stand ready to, uh, to participate in standard setting on big tech regulation and global governance with all uh, uh, fellow, fellow countries in, in the digital age. Thank you. Many thanks, Cheng uh, I think. Uh, uh, has been a very comprehensive and rich uh, presentation. Of course, we are monitoring uh, very, very closely what, what is going on in China and the type of lessons we are extracting from regulatory developments in your, in your jurisdiction. So let me actually start a second round uh, of intervention by our panelists with you, actually. Uh, and let me ask you a question about the, your financial holding companies. It's an important part of your regulatory framework. As you know, actually, in the proposals put forward by the general manager yesterday, uh, we believe it's a good idea, actually, this grouping of financial activities in a, in, a, in a legal entity and to subject a legal entity to, to prudential, prudential requirements. So it will be interesting knowing your experience about the implementation of this, and in particular, whether uh, you have actually imposed some sort of restrictions on the interactions between the, the financial holding company and the rest of the group, whether actually you are already happy by grouping all financial activities in a single uh, legal entity, uh, or whether you are actually imposing or considering imposing actually some sort of restrictions on those interactions with the rest of the big tech uh, group. Could you please, uh, Deputy Governor, could you please actually hear, can you hear us? So um, yeah, so so you are you are okay. So that question is addressed to me. So I I, I think uh, we just actually put out uh, a, a rule today uh, that talks about related party transactions. You know, basically, uh, so uh, um, transactions that would cover the, the transactions between financial holding companies and their non-financial businesses. So um, basically, the, the, uh, we, we require uh, related party transactions should be fair and should be disclosed to avoid illegitimate gains uh, by one party or the other. So, and, and uh, with, with monitoring, with disclosure, and with, uh, you know, with assessments from uh, some, in some cases, even auditors. So, um, uh, that's just uh, you know a simple answer to our, to our question. I hope that answers your question. Okay, many thanks. So let's go back to Tobias. I think you mentioned before that you are thinking of a regulatory framework that will be a combination of entity-based rules for the parent company, activity-based uh, rule actually for the different. Uh, for the different uh, subsidiaries, uh, so the host authority will actually be the one imposing those requirements at the host at the host level. I mean, this looks more broadly uh, compatible with the type of framework we are already proposing here at the at the BIS. But we're interested in knowing more details about how do you see actually this combination of activity-based and entity-based uh, uh, rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much. And. Um, let me take a step back and just think about uh, big techs uh, and financial services uh, around the globe. And I, I would distinguish uh, three, uh, three uh, segments. So, you know, one is uh, uh, China. And I think uh, we have heard uh, from, uh, from uh, Deputy Governor Zhuan uh, that uh, China really has introduced this uh, financial holding company approach. Of course, big techs in China have been very heavily 
um, um, uh, entered uh, financial services over over the past decade or so. And uh, I would say that uh, this entity-based uh, uh, approach is, is is very appropriate uh, and um, and you know uh, seems to be very effective. Um, secondly, there's the U.S. and of course um, we also heard um, from the U.S. that uh, you know there's much less uh, entry of big tech into financial services. There's some, of course, right? So there's the intervention in between the big techs and uh, and uh, existing financial institutions. Um, and there is some degree of financial service provision by big techs, uh, say, to, to on the B2B level, uh, to, to clients, et cetera. And then there's, of course, the infrastructure uh, provision in terms of cloud service provision. Um, but I would say that the degree of entry of big techs into financial services is much less pronounced in the US than, uh, say, in China. And then, of course, we have the whole rest of the world, um, and um, you know, which is, uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, Jose already uh, talked about uh, the the EU, but there are also many emerging markets, and in some emerging markets, uh, big techs uh, do uh, play an important role in in financial services, um, or at least uh, local local big techs, so to say. Um, and um, so uh, it is it is this combination of um, entity-based uh, approaches uh, in the host countries that we see as sensible, and then activity-based approaches in the receiving uh, countries um, that uh, we view as, as relatively effective. Uh, but having said that, uh, international cooperation is, is very much first order here. And I think the challenge is that um, um, Many of the issues are intertwined in between financial sector issues, regulatory, uh, uh, consumer protection issues, uh, conduct uh, issues. And um, f outside of the financial sphere in the central bank world, there's very little uh, international cooperation. So I would again um, agree with, with others that uh, more needs to be done here. Um, and. Um, I, I also want to, to resonate what, what Caroline uh, what, what was saying about um, you know this this other world which is about uh, crypto and um, uh, stable coins uh, etc. Um, you know there's certainly uh, a lot of momentum there and there are you know other entities uh, that are becoming uh, very important. Now there is a lot of uh, common regulatory uh, approaches there because that is clearly in the financial sphere. Uh, but there's a potential uh, for uh, uh, shifts uh, over time. Um, and, um, you know, I do worry a little bit that uh, the policy approaches might lag behind uh, the technology uh, innovation. So, you know, in, in that sense, uh, the, the discussion today is, is so relevant and, and future looking. Yeah. I Thank you for raising this issue about the, the timing of the regulatory action, right? I think the experience in China, we have heard it very clearly from the previous intervention, is well, one in which we start wait and see to see how big techs actually to develop, basically with a focus on trying to grab the sort of benefits that uh, participation of big techs in finance could actually bring. And then gradually, actually, you sort of tighten the regulatory requirements and then try to address the risk whenever they, they appear. Of course, the, the alternative approach is a sort of a cold shower type of approach. I mean, basically, you try to anticipate the problems, and you want basically the regulation to prevent the risk to materialize. Of course, it, those are difficult policy trade-offs. But 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 it's something. I mean, to have a view on this. I think it's better just to front load policy action, or or, or it's better just to to wait and see a little bit. Huh? That's a that's a that's an excellent excellent uh, uh, question, and um, you know our approach has always been balanced because there are huge opportunities, right? I mean, uh, uh, a, 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 as we heard, you know, we wake up, we use uh, uh, big techs uh, in, in, in probably uh, five different ways before having breakfast, right? And, um, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I think there are, there are clear benefits and there are clear risks. And so having uh, the balance right, um, within a framework, a legal framework, an institutional framework that is not set up for this evolution, rapid evolution, right? That, that, is, that is extremely challenging. 
And you know the discussions at the IMF or or, or the BIS, I think, uh, provide you know a, a really really good platform uh, uh, for for this consideration. But I I would say you know there are always trade offs, um, and and striking the right balance is 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 important here. Thank you, Tobias. Let's move now to uh, Jose Manuel. Um, I think you were asked by European Commission to provide them with advice on on. <coughs> on the, uh, how the US, you use EU's financial services regulatory and supervision remains appropriate in the context of digital finance. So this I understand is a request for advice to all uh, supervisory authorities, but of course the EBA had a leading role in relation to this, at least in what respects the topic of our discussion today. So what, what is there? Uh, and in particular, what type of recommendations you, you make in relation to big tech regulation? Yeah? Thank you. Um, let me start with something that, that's obvious, but, but maybe it's worth remembering. Okay, these, these are big texts. They're big. And they're big because basically two reasons. They operate globally across horizontally a number of companies. And when we think about how to regulate the challenges that they provide, we have to come from a reality of how regulatory work, which is basically sectoral and national. You know? and, and you need to try to find an equilibrium between those two aspects, right? So when I think about... Uh, how we go forward, where well, we need to start building, as I said before, from a sectoral to a financial. And then we talk about entity-based regulation of financial products, no longer of banks, or things like that, in the context of big techs. You know, but we need to go farther, and we need to go into like, okay, international collaboration, coordination, global standards, because at the end, what we would like is a global horizontal regulator for these big techs, potentially. And that's, that's not what we have. Now, how do you get there, and what's the process going forward? I think that, as, as you say, we need to advance within the feasibility of what we can do and trying to make sure that we, we at least tackle the most obvious damages or the most obvious dangerous areas. Our recommendation is that we think, as, as, the, pro, as the evolution evolves, to be very, very quick and, and, and simple and simplistic in the recommendation of the Commission, is that we need to think about mixed activity groups. We need to think about the possibility that we move forward into entity-based regulation as these entities themselves get more and more involved in financial products. As I said before, their presence formally is very small. But so similar to what the Chinese experience is showing, you know, I think as you see these entities being more prevalent in the financial service industry, you're more likely to require an entity-based approach in that process going forward. I'm a bit more reluctant about this idea that, that entity versus activity should be based on jurisdictions, you know, where there are home or host, because first the definition of what's home and what's host is, is, is not clear. And to me, it's more than saying, if I want to have <laughs> a analysis that should be based on the size of the market. So if I cannot do globally, and I am only concerned about the European Union market, then I, think about, think, I, th I need to think about, OK, what's the impact on the EU activity? What's the impact in financial stability? What's the impact in other aspects that are proper for regulation? And therefore, what's the appropriate tool to regulate there? You know, and I'll give you an example, for instance, for enforcement. And this is an issue in the, before I talked about Digital Operation Resilient Act, your ability to enforce and your enforcement measures are very different depending on where you have an entity that you can enforce upon because your, your mandate is by definition, in our case, regional, it's not global. So my ability to enforce on a foreign company certain actions is much smaller than a locally based company. So this has very, even if I have only an activity based regulation, it has clear limitations on the type of enforcement that I can impose if I want to correct some parts of that activity if the entity is not in my jurisdiction. You know, so I think that it's more important to probably work on what's the activity, what's the range of the market that I want to regulate, and then global standards as I go forward. But as, as the industry, as the techs themselves get deeper and deeper into the financial sector, obviously, which I think they're already pretty deep, by the way, you know, a more entity-based. And, a, and a, as a step forward, a mixed activity group regulation, you know, in which you either segregate a financial holding company or other types of holding companies will be the way forward. Okay, I think this is uh, quite interesting. I think we are talking about global entities. When you think about entity-based regulation, you're thinking about imposing requirements on the global operations uh, of these particular, particular entities. But of course, there is a, an alternative, actually, approach, which is subsidiarization, right? So basically required to establish legal establishments, uh, basically holding companies in different jurisdictions and trying to impose actually entity-based obligations on those holding companies grouping all activities in particular jurisdiction. Is this something that is being considered in the European Union? 
This is something that should probably, I mean, it would be considered in every jurisdiction, if I may, you know, it, it, in, in particular in the case of the Digital Operational Resilient Act, there's already a requirement that the entity that's providing the services should have a subsidiary that's incorporated in the European Union and should be the legally uh, liable. But the understand from you that there is no legal obligation actually for all services provided by the say critical uh, computing service providers, right? to be offered from the, that, that subsidy in the European Union? There is some obligation. Well, first of all, this is not in place. It will be in place at the end of 2024, right? The, the legislation. But the legislation says that there should be a local entity that's responsible for the provision, whether the service is provided directly or not. And that's an issue that's still, uh, in the technical details, but that the legal entity providing the service formally legally has to be. So beyond the, the provision of critical services, you are Thinking of something of that sort in other areas? Well, our recommendation was to assess, uh, assess uh, mixed activity groups, and this is in, in, the, in the recommendation that you mentioned at the beginning, our call for response to the call for advice yeah. to the Commission. Okay, great, very good, thank you. So, Caroline, now is your turn. I mean, the U.S. Is, has a very peculiar, even more peculiar, <laughs> supervisory structure than in the, in the European Union, complex, many agencies with different, uh, different remits. So how do you see, actually, the development of some sort of big tech regulation in your, in your country uh, that could be compatible with sort of uh, patchwork, if I may put, call it that way, of regulatory agencies? So I think um, what you described is an understatement. Uh, when, I ta when I think about uh, what financial regulatory framework is in the United States, uh, one of the jokes that I make is, of course, we have both entity and activity-based regulators. And, you know, many countries have a single peak model or a twin peak model, and I like to say that we have a whole mountain range. So there are five federal financial regulators, and then there's a bunch of miscellaneous other ones as well. But anyway, so when we think about the financial activities of big techs, I think this is actually fairly straightforward in the United States because, of course, we already have segregation between banking and commerce. And so with the Bank Holding Company Act, which um, is meant to keep banks from getting too far afield into commercial activities, and there was some discussion yesterday about sort of the historical reasons for that, um, but, you know, it isn't, does involve, it does come from a root of competition. Um, I think the same way that that law applies to banks and keeps banks from getting too far into commercial activities, you could do the reverse and basically say that if you start to do banking activities, you get pulled into um, the Bank Holding Company Act, which requires, you know, consolidated entity supervision and it's, there's a lot of things there, but it would, I think, achieve the segregation goals of the, of the model proposed um, in general manager Karsten's speech. So that would require, uh, I think, some legislative amendments, but it's one way to get at that. So then we would have entity level regulation over the financial activities. And uh, of course, we already have a, a global way of doing uh, supervision of GSIBs. Uh, across the world and, and supervisory colleges and home host regulation. And so I think, you know, once they have a consolidated entity, a, a bank holding company or a financial holding company, um, then that would be interesting. I think there is a, a debate, though, because I think in the United States, you know, when we think about banks, we traditionally think of like the three activities that make you a bank, which is deposit taking and lending and I think payments. And so, you know, where we have these non-banks who are doing financial services, it's because they unbundle and they do one of the things. And so I think we would have to examine that if they don't do all three, how do we address that? And there's, this has been a long-standing debate in the United States over narrow banks uh, and how to deal with that, uh, with that approach. Um, the other question when you look at the inclusion approach, which is having the group level requirements over a big tech, so this would include their commercial activities, um, and you want to think about governance requirements and conduct requirements and operational resilience and things like that. So as has been mentioned, these are US public companies. And you know they are subject to regulation as public companies by the SEC by the SEC's regulation of all public companies. And as I think many have noticed, the SEC has been very active in expanding into corporate governance and conduct and, uh, and many, many, many other fields, uh, which is a big debate in the United States. So we have these governance requirements at the group level. We have these conduct requirements at the group level. It extends far further than that. But then, of course, for a public company, you don't have a home host type of structure around that. So then is there a way to have some kind of uh, international coordinating body or something where 
in the US framework, it is unique, of course, because it is, they're listed in our um, public uh, capital markets. But if they have subsidiaries in other jurisdictions, is there a way to somehow coordinate? So this is a very interesting question. I look forward to some further debate on it. The other thing is that if we don't look to the existing um, regulation requirements that we have for US public companies, then the debate is, what would be the regulator in the United States? Would be some kind of competition type of authority or, or something like that. And so, um, you know, the Federal Trade Commission is the uh, sort of commercial activity federal you know, the Federal Trade Commission. But in the United States, again, for some of the my American civics lesson, uh, there's a U.S. focus because of this idea of um, sort of free markets and, and free ability to engage in business on ex post enforcement and not so much on ex ante supervision and regulation. So I think it would be very difficult to sort of create a, a new US regulator that is just a platform or big tech regulator um, or to give that authority to the FTC. I think people have discussed this in the past. There have been various bills and proposals around how to regulate big techs but none have passed. So um, more to come. <laughs>